Welcome to section two of reproductive anatomy. In this section, we will discuss the ligaments surrounding the female pelvic organs and some other important structures. Let's get started. This is a table with the major ligaments associated with the female reproductive organs. Let's start our discussion with the infundibulo pelvic ligament, which is also called the suspensory ligament. Jumping over to the local anatomy, it's important to recognize that this structure connects the ovary to the lateral pelvic wall. And therefore, it suspends the ovary, hence the term suspensory ligament. Here is an image showing the anterior view of the uterus, which we introduced in the first lecture. We have the fallopian tube over here, and we can see the suspensory ligament over here, and it connects to the lateralmost portion of the ovary. And in this image, it's covered up by the fimbriae of the fallopian tube. But just know that the suspensory ligament goes and connects to this lateral portion of the ovary. Now notice that traveling through the suspensory ligament is the ovarian artery and the ovarian vein. So this brings us to a very important clinical tie-in. There's a condition called ovarian torsion, and in this condition, the ovary twists around the ligament, thereby squeezing the contents that are within the ligament. And what contents are those? The ovarian artery and the ovarian vein. Therefore, ovarian torsion will decrease blood flow to the ovary and will cause ovarian ischemia. To help you remember that the suspensory ligament connects to the end of the ovary to suspend it to the abdominal wall, I use the phrase, suspend the end. Suspend the end. Let me explain what I mean by this. Let's say here are the ovaries. And here are lines depicting the abdominal wall. And right here are the ends of the ovaries. These are the lateral ends of the ovaries. What connects to these lateral ends of the ovaries? The suspensory ligaments. The suspensory ligaments connect the ovaries to the lateral abdominal wall. So you could say they suspend the ovaries by connecting to their lateral ends. So suspend the end. Again, here's the end of the ovary. And the ligament to connect it to the wall is the suspensory ligament. Suspend the end. So now we just talked about ovarian torsion and how this can lead to ovarian ischemia resulting from blockage of the ovarian artery. The last important idea to know about the suspensory ligament is that the ureter passes posteriorly and inferiorly. And this is important because during surgical removal of the ovary, the surgeon needs to be mindful of how close the ligament is to the ureter. So the surgeon is trying to ligate the suspensory ligament in an ooophorectomy, but he or she may accidentally damage the ureter because of how close it is. Remember, it passes just posteriorly and inferiorly to the ligament. Right here we have the ureter and it travels down to the bladder. We have one on each side. And if the surgeon is trying to remove the ovary, he or she will ligate the ovarian artery and vein. And in so doing, he or she can accidentally ligate the ureter, which can be devastating. Now that we've discussed the IP or suspensory ligament, let's talk about the uterosacral ligaments. These connect the uterus to the sacrum and this allows for support of the uterus. We can see the uterus right here and we have the posterior surface right here and the sacrum over here. And this uterosacral ligament will connect the two, offering uterine support. And this ligament is really important because if it's damaged, this can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. Now what is pelvic organ prolapse? Pelvic organ prolapse occurs when there's loss of supporting structures, like the ligament we just discussed. And when it's not there to support, then pelvic organs will herniate into the vaginal wall. And this loss of support often occurs in older women who have had multiple vaginal deliveries or prolonged deliveries. So in this way, Delivering babies actually weakens the supporting structures. Now we just talked about the uteral sacral ligament, but there are others you should be aware of. For example, the transverse cervical ligament and the levator ani muscles. Those are all important supporting structures. This image depicts the various types of pelvic organ prolapse. Look at this top left image labeled cystocell, and we can see the bladder right here. Notice how the bladder is protruding backwards posteriorly into the vaginal wall. You can imagine this process can lead to some urinary symptoms and we will discuss these symptoms in a moment. Now let's look at the top right image, rectocele. We can see the rectum right here, and we can see how it's protruding anteriorly into the vaginal wall. Now look at the bottom, enterocele. We can see this arrow, which is pressing downward into the vaginal wall. This indicates the intestines. The point is that weakness to supporting structures in the pelvis, most importantly the uterus, allows for prolapse of nearby organs into the vaginal wall. So now that we've discussed the uterosacral ligaments and how important it is for uterine support, and without it, we can get pelvic organ prolapse, let's do a question to apply what you've learned so far. A 67-year-old female presents for a routine physical exam. The physician examines the pelvis and notes that the posterior vaginal wall appears to bulge, especially when the patient coughs. What structure is more likely damaged, the uterosacral ligaments or the suspensory ligaments? Hopefully you notice that this patient has pelvic organ prolapse, and we know that because the posterior vaginal wall appears to bulge when the patient coughs. Of the two ligaments listed, which one is responsible for supporting the uterus? That would be the uterosacral ligaments. Once again, going back to this slide, we can see that the three supporting structures you need to be familiar with are the uterosacral ligaments, 
transverse cervical ligaments, which is also called the cardinal ligament, and the levator ani muscles. On the left image, we can see the uterosacral ligament. Now let's look at the right image. Although not shown, the transverse cervical ligament would be found here. And we will discuss this ligament later in this lecture. On the previous slide, we also mentioned the levator ani muscles and how they offer support. Now, these muscles are not a ligament, so we will not discuss these in this lecture. However, in the next lecture, we discuss the pelvic floor. And at that time, we will discuss the levator ani muscles and briefly revisit the idea of pelvic organ prolapse. So the take home point, if one or more of these structures are weak, patients can experience a form of pelvic organ prolapse, as we discussed before with this image. Now let's talk about the round ligament. The round ligament connects the uterine horn to the labia majora. Right here is what we would call the uterine horn. You can see it over here as well. And notice we have the round ligament labeled over here on the left, and it starts here at the horn, and then it continues outward. And going back to our table, the round ligament travels through the inguinal canal. And we discussed the inguinal canal in the GI anatomy chapter. And in that chapter, we introduced this image. We can see the inguinal canal right here. And in males, this conducts the spermatic cord. But in females, the inguinal canal conducts the round ligament. So if there's an inguinal hernia that travels through the inguinal canal, the intestines will travel with the round ligament and end up going to the labia majora, which is where the round ligament extends to. So for the round ligament, just remember that it travels through the inguinal canal and connects to the labia majora. And this means that indirect inguinal hernias will protrude through the inguinal canal which is the path of the round ligament. And this sagittal image is perhaps the best one to represent the round ligament, which you can see labeled right here. You can see how it attaches to the uterine horn up here, although you can't appreciate that it is the uterine horn, just know that it's in this region, as we just discussed. And then it will reach down to the labia majora, labeled here. Now let's talk about the ovarian ligament. This will connect the ovary to the uterus. There isn't anything really special you need to know about the ovarian ligament. I only include the ligament on this table because it can be often mistaken for other ligaments. For example, the suspensory ligament. So let's make sure you don't make the same mistake. So here's the uterus again, and notice this ligament goes from the uterus to the ovary, right here, the ovarian ligament, from the uterus to the ovary. Don't confuse this with the suspensory ligament over here, which connects the lateral portion of the uterus to the lateral wall. And again, I like to use the phrase suspend the end so that I can easily remember that it's the suspensory ligament that attaches to the end of the ovary and connects it to the lateral pelvic wall, suspending it. Suspend the end. Now let's do a question. A 49-year-old female is diagnosed with stage one left-sided ovarian cancer. During the surgery, several ligaments are transected to remove the ovary. Immediately upon removal of the ovary, the surgeons see profuse hemorrhage from one of the transected ligaments. The surgeon promptly begins to tie off the involved vessels. What vessels and ligament is he targeting? Hopefully you thought of the ovarian artery and veins. What ligament contains these? That would be the suspensory ligament, also called the infundibulopelvic ligament, or IP ligament. Recall from the table that the suspensory ligament contains the ovarian artery and vein, and it's ligated during oophorectomy. And going back to this image, we can clearly see that the suspensory ligament conducts the ovarian artery and vein. So when you want to remove the ovary, you're going to cut this ligament, which means you're going to ligate these vessels. Now let's talk about the transverse cervical or cardinal ligament. This ligament is important because it conducts the uterine artery and the vein. The transverse cervical ligament will attach from this lateral side of the uterus at the level of the cervix and attach it to the lateral pelvic wall. And if you picture the transverse cervical ligament in this area, then it's much easier to understand that it contains the uterine artery and vein, as well as the ureter, which you can see right here, and labeled up at the top right. And since it conducts the uterine artery and the uterine vein, this transverse cervical ligament is very important clinically, because if there's a hemorrhage of the uterus, let's say in a postpartum woman, these arteries can be targeted to stop the bleeding. So the physician needs to get through the transverse cervical ligament to get to these arteries. These arteries can also be ligated during a hysterectomy. So don't forget the transverse cervical ligament, also known as the cardinal ligament. And since this cardinal ligament contains the ureter, that means that during ligation of the uterine artery and vein, there can actually be damage to the ureter, just like we discussed up here with the IP ligament. When you ligate the ligament in oophorectomy, you can damage the ureter. Another important clinical tie-in is that the transverse cervical ligament is actually important for uterine support. That means that if there's damage or weakness of the cardinal ligament, the patient can experience pelvic organ prolapse. Recall from this slide regarding pelvic organ prolapse that the important supporting structures for the uterus include the uteral sacral ligament, which we already discussed, and the transverse cervical ligament, or cardinal ligament, which we just introduced. And since you can use the term transverse cervical or cardinal ligament, I can find that this can be a little bit confusing. For me, I think it's easiest to remember that it's the transverse cervical ligament. I like this title because it has cervical 
in the title, which reminds me that it connects the uterus to the pelvic wall at the level of the cervix. Or you can just remember cardinal ligament starts with a C, C for cervix. Either way, just remember that this ligament, the transverse cervical ligament, connects the uterus at the level of the cervix, and it supports it by connecting it to the lateral pelvic wall. The last ligament to discuss is the broad ligament. And really, it's just a fold of the peritoneum. And since it's a fold of the peritoneum, it's actually mesentery. And mesentery is discussed in great detail in section one of the gastrointestinal anatomy chapter. And these folds of the peritoneum can be divided into three portions. The mesosalpinx, which involves the fallopian tubes, the mesovarium, which involves the ovaries, and the mesometrium, which involves the uterine body. We can see these three portions right here, mesosalpinx, mesovarium, and mesometrium. Now pausing for just a moment, let's focus on the uterine artery and vein. We discussed how these are within the transverse cervical ligament. But if you're looking at the broad ligament, it looks like the uterine artery and vein actually pass through part of the broad ligament. And that's true. They actually do pass through the broad ligament. So let's make this simple. We have the broad ligament up here, and we have the transverse cervical ligament down below. And with this approach, you can imagine that the uterine artery and vein travel through here, and they can also extend into the broad ligament. Now this anatomy can be very confusing, but don't let it be. Just think of the broad ligament above conducting the uterine artery and vein. Just think of the transverse cervical ligament below near the cervix and conducting the uterine artery and vein. And above that, we have the broad ligament, which contains the extensions of the uterine artery and vein. Okay, so now let's just focus again on the broad ligament. Notice how the prefix in each word is meso. And this will help you remember that the mesentery is what's covering here. Mesosalpinx for uterine tube or fallopian tube, mesovarium for mesentery covering the ovary, and mesometrium for mesentery covering the uterus. So the final point regarding the broad ligament is that it can be transected during hysterectomy, which I guess goes without saying. Imagine if you have to remove the uterus right here, you're going to end up transecting the broad ligament. Now let's do one last question to apply what you learned. A 33-year-old female with endometriosis undergoes elective hysterectomy. During the surgery, the physician identifies the ureters on both sides of the uterus. She avoids ureter damage until she ligates the uterine artery on the right side. What ligament was she likely transecting at the time of ureter damage? With respect to the uterine artery, did the surgeon transect too far anteriorly or posteriorly? So we are told that the uterine artery was damaged at the same time as the ureter. And what ligament contains both the uterine artery and the ureter? That would be the cardinal ligament, or transverse cervical ligament. Now for the second part of the question. With respect to the uterine artery, did the surgeon transect too far anteriorly or posteriorly? Well, we know that the ureter passes behind the uterine artery and vein. So if you have the transverse cervical ligament right here, and we see that the uterine artery was damaged, you can clearly see on the image that the ureter, labeled up at the top, passes posteriorly to these vessels. So the surgeon likely transected too far posteriorly. Going back to the table, looking at the cardinal ligament, we can see that the uterine artery and vein is supposed to be ligated during hysterectomy, but with that, there can accidentally be damage to the ureter. So in answer to our question, the surgeon likely transected too far posteriorly, and that concludes this section.